All right, so here is our second video. Try and keep this one as short as yesterday. Is now we're going to start analyzing categorical data, and that's going to be this section. Um, and we're going to so by the end of this section of the book, and this corresponds, by the way, to section 1.1 of your textbook, is you should be able to construct and interpret bar graphs and pie charts, recognize good and bad graphs. And that's what we're going to do in today's video. And then in tomorrow's video, we'll be doing constructing and interpreting two-way tables, describing relationships between two categorical variables, and organizing statistical problems. Um, that's going to be a big one and, and the way we go about that. Uh, and this one is really setting us up for the AP exam. But for now, we're going to talk about just these two. So we're talking about graphs for categorical data. And the question is, what is categorical data? Well, if you remember from last video, categorical va variables place individuals into one of several groups or categories. Um, and the values are the labels for the different categories. So red, blue, green would be the values. The distribution just lists the number of counts or the percents of individuals who fall in each one. So this is, we can list the counts, or we can do a percent of the individuals. And let me show you what that looks like. Um, so someone did a survey of radio stations in America, and they classified them. Adult contemporary, adult standard, contemporary hits, country, news talk, oldies, religious, rock, Spanish language, and other formats. And there were a total of 13,838 radio stations. And they listed the number of each category. And this is what's known as a frequency count here. And they, it's the count of the stations. Now, what you could do is you could divide 1556 by 13,838, and you'd get 0.112, or... 11.2 percent. And so the difference between these two tables is one is showing counts and one is showing the relative frequency. And generally in relative frequencies you're going to see these, these are all going to be percents. But once again you can, all these values can be, you can go back and forth very easily and we probably will do that a little bit in class tomorrow. So here is a graph of the count of the stations. And here are the, the types, the data labels. And here are the counts. And this is what's known as a bar graph. And if we go back, we can see the smallest one was contemporary. And that was just a little bit over 500. And as it turns out, it was 569. Or we could display it by percentages and show this. And here, once again, is that contemporary. Uh, is that the contemporary? I believe so. And yeah, that's the contemporary. Um, and all the different categories. And this is a, the last one was a pie graph. I'm sorry, a bar graph. And this is a pie, pie graph. Um, what should all graphs have? Well, every graph should have a title. If your graph doesn't have a title in AP Stats, it's not going to fly. There should be a key, right? Right here, a key to, you can see right here, this is the key. This is saying what color on the graph goes to each category. And labeled axes. So if we go back, this would not fly because this axis here is missing a label. You would not receive full credit on the AP exam because you didn't label the axis. It should be number of stations. So, how do you create a pie graph? Well, back in when I was in school, when dinosaurs ro roamed the earth, in order to create a pie graph, you needed you had to use a um, protractor, and you multiplied each proportion by 360, and you measured out that angle, and you start at the top, 
And you notice that most pie graphs will start with a vertical line here, and then you'd figure out what this angle was, then you draw the next angle, and the next angle, and you draw it all the way around. Nobody does that anymore, and that's why we have computers. So now you would just put the data in Excel, and you go create pie chart, and bam, it'd pop up, and it'd be done like that. So pie charts used to be kind of rare, and then it become a lot more popular because of software. And it becomes very easy to make pie charts like this. Or, if you want to get fancy, pie charts like this. And I can zoom in here a little bit and you can see what's going on. Is if we look, you can see here is each one. This is the, I don't remember if there's a date on this chart, but this is the breakdown of different mobile operating systems in all the different countries. And so by, and they have the percentages here, and they broke them into the pie chart of Apple, BlackBerry, and Android. And what you can see is that Apple is very popular in the United States, but if we come over to Africa when this was made, oops, or where was that? Tunisia, the Nokia, when I click in Egypt, 80% of the people were using Nokia. They had a system called Symbian, and if we go back to view, zoom, uh, is this is in 2011. Obviously, the Nokia market share has plummeted since then, since they don't even own an operating system. Uh, a bar graph is what we showed earlier. We use a bar graph for categorical data. This is the big thing. The bars do not touch. Bars do not touch. No touching. Because if the bars touch, then it becomes a different type of graph called a histogram that we will use for quantitative data. Um, generally, the categories are on the horizontal axis. And it's basically to look at what is the most common and what is the most frequent. You can also do what are known as double bar graphs or segmented bar graphs for bivariate categorical data sets. And I'll give you an example of that. So here is simple categorical data. How, what percentage in the age group 12 to 17, what percentage of people own an MP3 player? And this is older data because you know, no one owns an MP3 player anymore because it's smartphones. Um, but here you have that data broken down in the percentages. And so we can turn that into a bar chart. And you can see the bars do not touch. Our categories are on the x-axis. And on the y-axis we have the percents. Um, I know this is not labeled percent, but because the title says percent owning an MP3 player, you would get away with that on the AP exam. The thing about graphs is that they can be abused. This is an example of a misleading graph. Because what happens is the human brain judges quantities by their area, which in a rectangle is their length times their width. And so you look at this, and you look at the Chevy here, and you look at the Nissan, and you're like, oh my gosh, the Chevy you know, this is the percentage of trucks still on the road. The Chevy is like 10 times better than the Nissan. But the problem here is the scale of the axis. Notice that it stop, starts at 95% and ends at 100. Look what happens if we rescale these exact same numbers and start at zero. So does Chevy better than Nissan? Yes. Is it much better than Nissan? No, not really. Um, and so we look at this. This is whenever you look at any type of advertisement that has a graph, you gotta look at the axes. You gotta look at how they're labeled. Here's another example of one. Uh, this is an ad from DirecTV, Dish Network, and Cable. Um, once again, the human brain does this by area. And so what they did is that the scale on this is correct but they made it much wider here. And so, if you look at this piece, well, 
So my one slide. It's one sixth the area of the cable, and so your mind processed that as DirecTV is six times better than cable, but 56 isn't even twice as much as 95. So this is deceptive graphs are used a lot, um, and this is that same graph rescaled. Now, obviously, customer satisfaction is higher with DirecTV than Dish than with cable. This is in. Also, it would be interesting, let's look at, do they list in the ad what the source of their data is? Uh, no, not really. And so, it, it's who was polled, who was asked, and this is, what you're going to do a lot in stats is question. You're going to question your data. Um, this is a side-by-side -side bar chart, where they're comparing the market share of uh, smartphone operating systems in July 2011, but they did it, uh, actually it's first quarter 2010 and first quarter 2011. So by looking at this, you can see growth or shrinkage. So the Nokia operating system went from 40 to 24, but the Apple was up, Research in Motion was down, Samsung was way up. Oh, I'm sorry, this isn't operating systems, this is uh, companies that make smartphones. HTC was up, Sony was up. LG was up, Motorola was flat, but you can see Nokia, the death of Nokia coming and the death of Research in Motion coming, which is the BlackBerry. Um, another one is what's known as a stacked bar chart, where we take two related variables and we stack them on top of each other. So this is showing the uh, market crash that started the great, what is known as now as the Great Recession, um, which is mortgages that were in foreclosure or that were 90 days past due but not yet in foreclosure. And we put the two together, those are people that are in distress as far as paying their mortgage. And so both of them go up, but when compounded, you can see that they really, really start to stack up and we can see the trend. Um, this is a similar thing. This is still categorical data, and instead of doing bars, you can see this, is they connected the dots. And so once again, mobile operating systems from 2009 to 2014, and as we were talking earlier, you can see the downward trend of Nokia, um, the upward rise of Android, and the downward trend of Research in Motion, which is BlackBerry. Uh, Windows Mobile, I think, and I would love to see 2015 and 2016 data on this, um, because I think Windows Mobile has gone up and Nokia has just almost disappeared um, it's from the world. Um, this is the similar to the bar chart, it's just instead of doing the bars, they're plotting the points and connecting them with lines, but it is still categorical data. All right, so that's it for this video. Uh, make sure you watch it because we're going to do a lot on this tomorrow in class.